Thank you both so much for joining the festival. I know directors usually don't like to say too much about the film before a screening like this, but maybe Carrie, you could say something about how this whole Bond experience has been for you. Well, first, I had a question. Uh, how many people here tonight have already seen the movie? <laughs> cool, cool. I can't believe I came back again. <laughs> don't tell everyone else the ending, please. Uh, had the whole experience. Uh, I've been shooting this whole time. <laughs> I just finished shooting two days ago for the series. I didn't really get to partake that much in the experience, but I've you know, heard from friends who have seen the movie. And obviously, we had a premiere in London. That's a lot of fun. Can you guys hear me? Louder. Yeah. Louder. Do we need to turn the volume up, or do I need to speak louder? Louder. Maybe closer. <laughs> closer. Is it? Yeah. Does it sound louder? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, what was your relation to the James Bond films before stepping into this production? Um, you know, I, I watched the movies uh, as a kid, and uh, A View to a Kill was the first Bond movie I ever saw in the cinema, and that was still Roger Moore, I think it was his last film actually. And uh, I sort of drifted away a bit from the, the films after Timothy Dalton, and the, the Pierce Brosnan age, I was in high school college, and then uh, when Daniel Craig did Casino Royale, uh, I loved that film. It brought me back into the franchise and brought me back into the experience of you know, following Bond's escapades around the world. And I remember um, after Spectre, when it seemed Daniel wasn't going to do another one, I wrote to Barbara Broccoli to see if you know I could be considered for the next Bond film. And then I didn't think anything of it, and then they went to Danny Boyle, so I guess they didn't think about me. But then Danny Boyle dropped out, and then I wrote her again and said, hey, you know, there's still a chance. I'd love to talk to you about it. And then two weeks later, I was at her house interviewing to be the director, and it really honored three years later. <laughs> Here we are. The lesson there is to try twice. Yeah. Sometimes you fail the first time. Well, it's nice to hear that directors also audition. <laughs> That's a good lesson. Listen, look, I read somewhere that you also played uh, GoldenEye on Nintendo 64 yeah. with, with your cousin or something like that. Was that part of your yeah. bond schooling? My cousin's family had Nintendo and our family had Sega. So we didn't have GoldenEye at my house, but we had it at my cousin's house. And so, you know, like, holidays were spent fighting over who got to play GoldenEye. I sucked, so I always like died out really quick, and I had to wait for like seven other cousins to play. Again. Do you remember which character you used to play? Bond. I always played Bond. Uh, I always played Bond Young because he was so short, so it was hard to hit. So. Uh, and Delvin, how did you get involved in this? I didn't even know there was a game. That's <laughs> uh, how I got involved. I mean, I I, uh, I don't know if there might be a couple of other actors here. I I actually. Um, Audition for Skyfall back in 2012, and I met with uh, what's Debbie, Debbie, Debbie Williams. Williams. Yeah, I think Bond has always uh, attracted uh, local talent in the sense that it, uh, if you look at a Bond film, any Bond film, they're very exotic locations, and there's always some Italian or somebody who's not necessarily um, based in an Anglo-Saxon uh, language. You know, upbringing. So that was an opening for me, of course. But then having met with Debbie uh, back in 12, and I didn't get the role, and then there were a couple of other films, and but then she circled back. I had met her, um, you know, over the years here and there, and uh, I think it's when Carrie came on board and, and Danny Boyle left that I got the call, and she asked me, or somebody asked me, to come to London to, uh, to meet with Carrie. And uh, I said, I can, I can spend hours telling this story, man. But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I flew back and forth a couple of times. Uh, I did an audition, but then suddenly I did audition. But then on the way back, I got the call, and they asked me, Do you, would you like to start the negotiation? You shut up and did a weird accent in addition to that. I, well, the reason I did a weird accent is that, so Debbie calls me up, and uh, I, I think I'm in the mix, I'm in the mix, I'm in the mix. And then they call me up and said, no. Uh, Rami Malek is, oh, I didn't say no, he said Rami Malek is going to play the villain. And then I said, oh. <laughs> and so I thought that was it, just like any old story. Uh, but then she said, no, but there might be another role for you, and uh, could you just prepare that? Um, a scene from Skyfall, actually. 
uh, with a Cuban accent. And I thought to myself, I can do a, I can do a Cuban accent. <laughs> I think many other actors would be better at it. And then basically Javier. Yeah. I know, I, I think I, I tried to do a Scarface take on, on an accent. But then uh, Carrie had no idea I, was I had prepared this. So you said to Daddy, why did you do a Cuban accent? The guy's Russian. <laughs> And then he even says, listen, David, no, we've seen your work, you don't have to act. But then I said, listen, if we're going to do this, you're going to have to call action at some point, and I'm going to have to do some acting, so why don't you just do it right now? And I said, uh, let, let me just show Because prior to that, we just talked. Yeah. However, you didn't audition. You were not doing a scene, we were just talking. Talking, just talking. happens a lot. You don't always act, ask uh, experienced actors to do a scene. Sometimes you just have a conversation. Yeah. So we've had a couple of those conversations, and then I said, no, well, let me just, I mean, I'm on the plane back to Heathrow any minute now, let me just do this stupid Cuban accent from a movie that's already been made in a dialect that's not relevant. Uh, and then he says, oh, let me go get Barbara and Michael, who are just across the hall. So I put myself in a position where I then had to uh, perform this uh, monologue in front of, the, you know, the, the A-team of the Bond franchise, and I felt very stupid. But on the way back in the car... You prepared it for tonight. You're going to do it for them tonight, right? Yeah. Well, that was... <laughs> that was just me. It wasn't about rats and you know, you figure out the rest. I can never remember the lines. I would have done it had I known the lines. <laughs> so tell us about your character, the one you ended up playing in this film. Well, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a, what do you call it? Work in progress. So we're together with the Carrie and together with the, the writing team. Uh, there were some elements in the writing that then later was chucked. I mean, remember we talked about Rick Moranis from Ghostbusters? Like, uh, are you the gatekeeper? Uh, are you the key master? Yes. I don't know, you might even know. the guy from the subway, too. The guy from the subway. So Carrie sent me these TikTok clips of weird Russians uh, <laughs> for inspiration, I suppose. It was just through the, the, through the character out of the ballpark completely. <laughs> Uh, but it was good fun, and um, I think we made it up as we went along, you know. Um, he's very much, I mean, without exposing too much, the guy gets kidnapped early on, like, in this first scene, pretty much. And uh, so then it's, he's behaving under the circumstances of being kidnapped, which is, this, in this, in my interpretation, is a very stressful thing. Some people might find it less stressful. <laughs> But I found it stressful. Uh, so there was that, a lot of good circumstances, a lot of shooting going on. Also, we didn't shoot in order. So, for example, his first scene was kind of the middle of the movie. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was you running. Me running, yeah. Yeah, running like a crap. And that was when Daniel injured his foot. His right? ankle, yeah. And that was the very last scene we shot in the entire film after seven million months of shooting was uh, uh, you and and Daniel running. Again, yeah, like <laughs> the minute, the, the second scene. before he the very he last scene that we shot the entire production. Yeah. And Daniel's last scene as James Bond was you and the running. Exactly, that was, uh, that was movie, uh, movie history right there. Because <laughs> I was there. <laughs> and it was his last scene, was <laughs> Get it. Kerry, you are uh, part Swedish, if I'm not wrong, and uh, there's another Swedish connection to this film. I'm thinking of uh, DP Linus Sanga. Uh, what was it with Linus' previous films that made you pick him, and what was your like ideas for the visual style of this film? Uh, I first learned about Linus through um, Emma Stone, and then I, I just had a series called Maniac. And uh, she said, you need to work with Venus, he's amazing. She'd done two or three films with him. And, he's, and she's like, he's going to teach me how to become a cinematographer. And I'm like, well, I think must be really patient. I should meet this guy. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we FaceTimed, and, and uh, did they turn this up too loud now? I feel like I was like, oh. OK. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, in the fall, when I was crewing up, uh, is when uh, Damien Chazelle's film First Man came out, which is about Neil Armstrong going to the moon. And they did a lot of mixed format, 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and this stuff. Uh, they did some IMAX in the end, but they also had this really special 65 millimeter footage that NASA had, which was a unique format. And there was just an amazing mixture of archival plus stuff that Venus had shot, and it just all, in my mind, went together really well. And uh, 
I think it was one of the best crafted films of the year that year. And so, in trying to come up with a way to uh, uh, film this one, I, I knew I wanted to work with a real, you know, cinema craftsman and, 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 and bring some, some vision and continuity and art to, to the series, at least for my part. And uh, Enos was a, an amazing partner in this thing, such a sweet and, and earnest and super talented guy. And the way we worked is he would, we talk about sequences and then he would put together kind of a, a lookbook, you know, a lookbook would contain color references or contrast with references or um, uh, just mood in general. You know, it's almost like a fashion shoot or something when you put together these mood boards. And uh, they were really inspirational, I think, even for certain sequences, like figuring out how you would color it and craft it. For example, there's a sequence um, uh, with this guy after the Cuba section, you'll see this boat, and the way we did the boat was very much referenced by a sort of like a bunch of different artistic, uh, um, um, it was an art piece basically that would be used as an inspiration in terms of color, color lines. It's, it's unique. Uh, what else? Uh, we also, I think we were, the last Bond film had been shot, let's see, Skyfall was Deacon's and that was shot digitally, but then um, uh, Spectre was shot on film again and we wanted to make sure we shot on film, we shot on 35. So to sort of, as a sort of like a, a bargaining point with the studio, we said, we'd like to shoot IMAX and, and therefore 35 would seem like a really decent compromise, but then they said yes to IMAX. So that also surprised us. So we ended up shooting like 25 minutes of the film in IMAX as well. And that, was, that was the fun. So I'd love to shoot an entire film in IMAX because that's it's beautiful. When you yeah. see the projected dailies of IMAX, it's incredible. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, I guess you've both seen the film quite a few times now, but do you have any favorite moments or scene that sticks with you that you're actually sort of fond of when you rewatch it? Question to both of you, I guess. I, I very much like uh, I like Italy. I think that's really great. I think it's a great start to the film um, uh, when he, when they're in Italy. Um, I don't. I think it's so colorful. It's so exotic and exciting. Uh, I really like the parts where I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I like, um, I think it, yeah, I think the movie uh, starts and ends well, so I, I like, you know, uh, there's a lot of parts I like throughout, and then there's other parts, you know, when you make something, you know you want to do it differently after, after the fact, but, you know, it's, it's always like that. So, I don't know. If you want to, oh, sorry, no, it's, it's up to the audience to decide what they like. We right. will see soon. Um, if you want to hear more from Kerry about uh, making of this film and his earlier works, there's going to be a masterclass that we talked about tomorrow at Klokan 3 at Filmhuset. So please join us there. Um, and finally, David, that Russian accent. You, uh, you have a Swedish-Russian accent. That is um, common for Swedish actors to play sort of a Russian thief. Yeah. And uh, you were... <laughs> Your accent really gets me in this one. Uh, it's like you're funny even when you're not trying to be funny, when you're trying to be mean or threatening, it's even more funny. Yeah. And I was hoping you might introduce the film to the audience using a bit of that accent. <laughs> I don't, it's bad. I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's not boring. It's pretty much boring, yeah. He sent me over a couple of clips. He sent over a couple of clips for me to get inspiration. Uh, I don't, it's just, uh, all, all of it is improvisation. And uh, now I hope you have good evening in the movie house. <laughs> Thank you.